Welcome to Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and students with mental illnesses to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Good night, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our of Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and students with mental health challenges to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Today, guys, we have a special guest with us. Today, we have Giselle Taraba with us. Uh, who is Giselle Taraba? Well, Giselle Taraba has a double master's, double master's, one in research and one in social work. She has a vast experience in compassion at, in organizations and is the co-owner of the Matri Center for Love and Compassion, where she helps individuals remember their own self-love and self-compassion. So I'm looking forward to today's interview and yeah, so welcome Giselle. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. We're very, very grateful. Very grateful for this opportunity. Awesome. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your profession, what you do, and um, what the Matri Center is, and just tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm a co-owner of Matri Center for Loving Compassion, and I co-own this with my husband. Um, we both do this work. Um, I, um, I used to work in the field of child protection for many years, um, got into it because of some own, my own childhood adversity in my family. So there's like intergenerational trauma. Um, and so got into child welfare, hoping to save children. <laughs> and like anything else, you realize that, you know, that the systems don't save people. It's uh, people help themselves and, and help people. Um, and so um, did a, so that's what I was doing my master's in research. I was in child welfare doing quality assurance. Um, and then as I spoke to more families and their children learn more about how these systems can be very disengaging and disempowering. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, I was kind of going through my own journey of, um, you know, kind of my trauma kind of bubbled up. Um, and I found through my own self-love and self-compassion journey, uh, I was able to come through it. And then I thought to myself, why aren't we using this? Like, why aren't we creating systems that are helping people remember their own power, remember their own self-love and self-compassion? Why aren't these systems based on healing instead of punishing and, you know, separating and dividing? Mm -hmm. um, and so hence the Maitri Center, oh, other way, uh, the Maitri Center was born um, in our desire to help people remember that they are truly compassionate and loving, that, uh, that everything that they're looking for is already within. Um, and so we work with individuals and we work with individuals within systems and within uh, businesses to help kind of create environments that help people, the fostering of people's self-mastery and uh, their own self-empowerment rather than um, the kind of systems we have, which are very disempowering and very divisive and fear-based. So that's kind of a long way of how we actually ended up doing this work. Um, and uh, we also have a podcast as well, where we share stories of people, uh, you know, who had faced adversity um, and who have been on their path to loving themselves and being more compassionate towards themselves. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of how we got into this work. Awesome. Sounds very empowering and um, that it impacts um, the community, which is awesome. Really cool. So with that said, we are going to switch into the mental health piece of this interview. So my first question to you is, what is your mental health diagnosis and when were you diagnosed? Um, so I wasn't actually technically diagnosed, I guess I self-diagnosed. Um, but, uh, but the issue is, um, so I grew up in an environment that was very negative. So um, both my parents, I would say more my mom than anyone else experienced horrible child abuse. Um, and so uh, here you have a traumatized person trying to raise children. And so my sister and I really kind of learned the, the skills of traumatized children, right? And so we had these skills where 
we had a lot of negative thinking. There was a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, in my household, there was some depression. Um, and uh, primarily, really, it was the anxiety that was paralyzing. Um, I had what I thought were heart attacks, were actually panic attacks. Mm. Uh, when I was doing my first master, I'd never had a panic attack before uh, and thought I was having a heart attack, which I didn't really think that I was a 20 year old. So why would I be having a heart attack? I ended up uh, going to emerge only to find out that I had had an anxiety attack and learned what it was. Um, and so there was a lot, a lot of fear in our household and a lot of negative thinking. Um, and so that led to a lot of distrust of people, a lot of hypervigilance and uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, sometimes symptoms made relationships really hard because I, I certainly wasn't trusting anyone. And I was always, I always had my hat and my coat ready to go. <laughs> so whenever I started dating someone, I'd be like, well, this is, we're just going to get really close. So this is about the time when I eject out of this relationship. <laughs> um, and so it made relationships really challenging uh, because I could never trust anyone uh, because I grew up in a household where people were not to be trusted and that everything was really negative and every, the world was somewhere to be feared. Everyone was potentially a potential predator or a potential threat. Um, and so it made living really challenging uh, and it made uh, having friendships or relationships really challenging. Um, and so that's kind of how, and I, I, I knew um, that it was anxiety and I knew that I was having panic attacks, um, but didn't want to take medication. I had, uh, I knew that my mom had dabbled, I guess, and it didn't really help her. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so um, we also came from a culture, I'm, I'm Latino, um, where you just kind of sucked it up. Like you didn't really talk to anybody about your problem. Uh, you didn't really uh, divulge to anyone because it was none of their business. You have to show kind of this illusion of perfection because what will people say? In a lot of Latino cultures, there is that belief of like, what will people say? What will the neighbors say? What will people say that there's something wrong with our family if we talk about some of these issues uh, and share them with everyone. Um, and so it made for a lot of secrecy and it made for a lot of um, shame, I guess. And it's not to say that our childhoods weren't um, happy, right? Like we had components that were really happy, um, but it wasn't um, the lack of trust and the fear prevented us from kind of living full lives, I would say. Mm. Wow. Um, okay, interesting. So tell us a little bit more about your mental health story of resilience. What did you have to overcome? And um, how did you go from going with all the anxiety attacks to where you are now, where you're, you're managing everything? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. It's, it's kind of a funny story. Um, first of all, I wasn't aware that I was doing it to myself. That was the first part of it. Like, um, we kind of have this saying in the in the compassion community where it's like pain is not optional all of us are going to suffer something they're going to have something because we live in this you know physical world uh, but suffering can be optional in the sense that suffering is usually pain with resistance attached to it so um i was resisting a lot of things i didn't like myself i didn't like how i looked i didn't like um i didn't trust anyone i was in constant fear and I didn't realize that really this was all my thinking. And it was my thinking that was continuously causing my own suffering. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I was sitting with a girlfriend, we were having lunch, you know, um, with my bestie Angie. And I was complaining about my then boyfriend, about how he was making comments about old women and how insecure I felt and what if he's gonna leave me. And my girlfriend's like eating salad, right? And she stops and she leans in and she goes, why are you doing this to yourself? Mm. And I went, what? I'm doing this to myself. And then she just went back to eating. Like she didn't even expand or anything. And we kind of finished our conversation and I was like, damn it, she's so right. And I started to realize that my own thinking was hurting me, that I was being unloving and uncompassionate towards myself. I was telling myself that I wasn't good enough. I was telling myself that I wasn't worthy of love and compassion and affection. And I wasn't worthy of all of the things and that I wasn't safe. Um, and so what the, so that's kind of started the impetus for me realizing about that, but it took a few years to kind of realize that I had 
that I actually had to get to the point where I was fed up with my own thinking, that the cost of not changing was greater than changing, right? So for me, the, the work that I had to do um, really began when I made a decision to change. I made a decision to not be the most loving and compassionate that I could to myself and not do that to myself, no matter what happened to me. Um, and it really started with, um, I started with positive affirmations. I don't know if you've heard of a lady called Louise Hay. I know people, a lot of people. So, it's, so she's just basically is a lady that goes around and tells you everything's fine. So she talks about compassion and she talks about loving yourself and she talks about positive thinking. And so the first step for me in my journey was reprogramming my brain. I had to move away from that negative thinking that everyone was a threat and that everything was horrible to start to think, you know what? People are good. There are good things in the world. I am safe. I am compassionate. I'm loving and people are doing the best they can. And so I would play that in the loop on an ongoing basis. Now, this may not work for everyone, but it, it started kind of my journey. And then I started with meditation and mindfulness. I really uh, had to go in and sit in meditation. Uh, I started with five minutes because meditating was hard because all of those emotions that I didn't want to face were in there. And then when they start to come up, you're like, well, I was, I suppressed you for a reason. I don't want to talk to you and I don't want to see you. And so I sat in meditation and I, I, you know, every time that it got scary, I leaned in and as far as I could, and I gave myself love when I was in there. Um, and over time now I'm able to meditate an hour, an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and, um, and I also found that, uh, I also did a, a, a self-compassion program and now I'm kind of certified in it. I am certified in it. Uh, but, uh, in it, which add, I was an augmentation to my mindfulness program. And basically what it was, was what I was already doing kind of in small spurts, which is being there for myself, mm -hmm. giving myself that love in insecurity and safety that I was looking for for others, for my partner, for my parents, uh, for my friends. I started giving myself what I needed in the moment. I started to honor myself. And if a negative thought came up, rather than fighting it and saying it, get out of here, I hate you. I would just say, okay, I get it. You know, you're afraid. It's okay to be afraid. We've been afraid before, but we've also overcome it before. And so the more I showed up for myself, the more I was able to kind of Say, okay, I can cope with this. And the more that I did that, the more positive things started happening, the more positive I felt and the less of those thoughts would come. And they do come still. Uh, but then I just kind of welcome them and say, oh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I don't have to believe them and I don't have to go deeply into them. I can just acknowledge them and allow them to pass. Um, but it has taken that commitment. I had to do and decide to do that for myself. Okay. <laughs> And I, I, I like the part where you, you, you know, you, you mentioned that it all started with the decision, you know, to, to, to acknowledge that there was something wrong so that, that you can actually move forward. You know, we have to decide first, yeah. you know, that we want better, that we don't want to be stuck in the same rut that we've been in. So, yeah. yeah. So the next question I have for you is what did you have to do to overcome or bounce back from your low points? List all resources that were applicable. Yeah, um, so I would say that the number one thing is not so much a resources. There's a lot of great resources. There's a lot, so many people that are super helpful. Um, I have to go back to that commitment. I had to decide that how I felt was more important like what I meant, what I mean is I had to decide that feeling good and being positive and loving to myself was more important than my being afraid. And so I really had to lean in and probably the hardest time. And sometimes it's hard. Like sometimes it has felt hard where you just feel so heavy and you feel so tired. But when you continue to commit and show up for yourself and say, I'm here, I'm doing the work, I'm going to go inward, I'm going to give myself love, I'm going to give myself tenderness and safety and show up for yourself, that's really what you, what really get, helps you to overcome those pieces. Now, for any of the audience, whatever helps them is going to work for you. Not everyone 
Louise Hayes is not helpful for everyone. Meditation may not be helpful for everyone. Uh, positive affirmations may not be helpful for everyone. So people do have to experiment and try to find the things that really make, make them feel uh, safe and, and joyful and happy and aligned. And, and, and so those, a lot of those higher vibrations. Um, so for me, it was really about the commitment and I tried different things. Um, I, I, I listened to Joe Dispenza, whom I really like and appreciate. I still listen to Louise Hayes. Um, I follow Emmanuel Dagger, um, but there comes a point, um, Cleone, that really you become, you start to embody or make a decision to become your own master and become your own guide. Meaning that, that I realized that nobody was coming to save me. There were so many times when my, my husband would be there for me and he would reassure me and he would tell me everything was going to be fine. And to be honest, I kind of became addicted to that. I would always, whenever something came up, I would be like, David, you know, this is happening for me. Like, you know, tell me everything's going to be fine. And to be honest, it didn't entirely fill the gap, but it never actually quite did it. When I started telling myself, when I started relying on my own mastery and realizing that the power was always within and no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. That's when things shifted for me. Yeah. Um, so all of these resources were amazing and I'm super grateful for all of them in my journey and all the people that I have met and, and that I have uh, listened to from like Emmanuel Dagger. Uh, he's amazing. Um, so these people I have used as my community uh, to kind of wrap around myself. But in the end, it was really me I was looking for. Um, so, and here's the, the, the key thing clearly that I learned, which was amazing. You know, for a long time, I really wasn't very loving of myself. Like I didn't really feel that attractive. I kind of have an interesting nose. And, and so I, um, I was always looking for external validation of my own worthiness. And when I actually gave that to myself, whether people thought I was worthy didn't matter. Now they started giving it to me. So all of that stuff I started giving to myself, people would reflect back to me. So they would say all of these things, but it, they didn't matter anymore. Like I was grateful to, to hear it and receive it, but I was already giving that to myself. So I didn't really need it in the same way. Right, okay. That makes sense, that makes sense. So what are three things you wish you had available when you wish, when you were at your lowest point? Um, three things I wish I had had available when I was at my low point. Um, I wish, um, I wish I had courage. I had wished that I had, um, there are times when I, when things started to really bubble up and I didn't want to face them because they were so scary. Mm -hmm. um, me deciding to disconnect again only compounded the problem for me. So I wish that I had had the courage at times to really sit with myself and give myself and to see the, the hurt and the suffering and to walk myself through it. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wish that I had reached out more to people because my journey I didn't do this all by myself either, right? Like even though the commitment is important and the journey towards yourself is important, we kind of live in this world with other people so that they can help us. We can help each other. I'm here exactly. to help you, you're here to help me. So reaching out to my support system and being honest about what I felt instead of feeling the need to be perfect and to be at all together and to look like I'm functional. Um, I wish I had been more honest about how I really felt about things um, and reached out for support because I think I would have found out that people needed my help as much as I needed theirs mm. um, yeah okay. and uh, I can't think of a third one right now <laughs> sorry okay that's all right <laughs> all right um, my next question then would be so what words of hope would you give to our listeners what would you tell them yeah um, I would say you, you got this, you can do this. You are already everything you're looking for. It's all within. Um, if you're feeling too overwhelmed and you can't go in, then reach out. Have people that surround you that, are, that believe in you, that support you. Um, but you can do this, you, but th th you have to commit to yourself. You have to commit to giving yourself all of those things that you wish you would, that somebody else would give to you. And I can guarantee that it pays enormous dividends. It does, it does 
um, when you, and the other thing too, that I would recommend too, is people listen to your own inner wisdom. And that's one of the things that trauma does. It, it really gets us disconnected from ourselves, disconnected from our own inner voice and inner guidance. But you have a higher self that tells, that knows what your path is for you. Uh, all of us, the rest of us are here to help you on that path, maybe by you know, sharing a piece of advice or giving you a book or sharing a story that might resonate with you and say, hey, that that would actually, that my higher self is saying, yeah, that's, that's, that really resonates with me. Uh, but really ultimately, you know, um, you can do this, you got this. Um, in whatever way that you can help yourself get to that journey and reach out to people and use your resources. Um, I, I believe that everyone can do this. Yeah. You're not too broken. I think that one of the myths that people think is that um, they're too broken. Nobody is broken. The soul cannot be broken. The spirit cannot be broken. Um, yeah. and, but I know if it has felt that way. I, I know I felt that way in the past as well. But um, yeah, you can, you can do this. You got this. Very powerful advice. I love it. I love it. So now what we're going to do, we're going to switch a little bit in topics. Um, we're going to, as you can see behind me, there is a book that's called The Music of My Life. And basically that book is about my journey with music therapy and um, bipolar disorder. So with that said, what type of music do you like? Oh, um, oh gosh, I love, to be honest, I love all different types of music. I love Latino music because that's my roots. I love, um, my husband introduced me to some, uh, you know, like the, the 70s, 60s, you know, like uh, 80s, I love 90s. I'm a big 90s girl. I grew up in the 90s, so I love the 90s music. Um, I also love, it's interesting, but because I, I am multicultural, like because I, I've been exposed to um, Hispanic music, Hispanic music also has some African traditions to it. And so there's some beautiful music that I've been introduced to. But even I'm so amazed about how music, music trans, like it just, it translates, it, it's beyond boundaries. It transcends boundaries. Right. Right? Like, like that, like the, um, you know, that Korean song, like it became an international hit and nobody knew what it was saying, but <laughs> it's the way that music just kind of lifts your, your, your energy, like it lifts your vibration and it makes you feel an alignment. And so I think music is so, so powerful. So, so yeah. powerful. But yeah, so I like lots of different types of music. Okay. I'm not from cool. country, but I'm learning to love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right understood so if you were to think of a song that best describes your journey what would it be and why i would say it's so funny uh because you know the question has journey in it and i would say it is actually a song from journey which is don't stop believing that song don't stop believing well not a good singer but <laughs> it's a good song because it, it really is about empowerment right it's about like you know what we believe we see, and if we believe in ourselves, when we believe in ourselves, uh, we can overcome all adversity and move ourselves forward and live our dreams. Mm -hmm. And a lot of successful people, people that have overcome huge challenges say that it starts with the belief. It starts with the belief in ourselves um, that kind of gets us to the other side. So don't stop believing. Amen, I love that, love that. Okay, so Giselle, so how can we stay in touch with you? What are your social media handles? Ah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for asking that. Um, I think it's on the on my little screen. So our social media handles are at my tree center one. So M A I T R I C E N T R E one. Um, so look for us uh, there. Um, I also have a LinkedIn account under my name, Giselle Taraba. Uh, and if you want to email us or work with us, um, it's info at mytreecenter.com. Um, yeah, and stay in touch. That would be super great. Super great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Giselle, for this interview and for um, sharing with us your journey with us. That's been, it was really awesome. And, you know, it all, like, like you said, it all starts with a decision, you know, we have, we have to decide that we want better in order to get better. So with that said, and to all you resilient minds out there, until next time, please subscribe to us on all our platforms and don't forget to rate the show and leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts. Also, join the community of resilient minds and sign up for our monthly newsletter at cleonycrawford.com. B 
Be sure to grab a copy of my book, The Music of My Life, on all Amazon marketplaces to get to know me better. And if you can think of one person that will receive value from today's show or connect with Giselle's testimonial, please share it with them. Feel free to take a screenshot of this week's episode of the podcast and tag us on Instagram. You can tag myself at only Cleone or Resilient Minds 365 and today's guest at the Maitri Center One. Um, and remember, mental health is not a death sentence. Despite your, Ill your illness, you can strive, thrive, and live a life of abundance. Until next time, I'm Cleone Crawford, and I'm signing off. <laughs>